shooting day. No kidding. Temperature in the 60s and no breeze. I'm telling you, at an altitude of 100 feet, maybe there was some rustling and that was about it. So we really took advantage of it, Dan Schaefer and myself, to put up a 160 meter loop skywire up at his property up in Northern Greenwich. Nice layout, nice elevation, perfect place to put a horizontal loop. And no kidding, I've always wanted to put up one for 160 meters, uh, something somewhat similar to what Gus used to run for his configuration uh, over in New Canaan, or rather Darien. This is my first opportunity to have a piece of property that could really support one of these horizontal loops. So definitely a Sunday afternoon well spent and definitely a worthwhile project to say the least, okay? All right, so what we wanted to do is just give you a little background on what a loop skywire is. And really the name goes all the way back to an article that appeared in QST Magazine back in the 1980s that just talked for the first time about the concept of setting up a square horizontal loop. And really loop skywire, you'll hear some people use it. It's kind of the old fashioned term really, just referring to it as a horizontal loop is sufficient to identify it to most people these days. But again, it's horizontally polarized with respect to the earth. Characteristics, makes for an ulti the ultimate multi-band antenna. Uh, in the case of this one, this is cut for a base frequency of 160 meters. You can use this for everything all the way up to 10 meters, no problem. And with the proper tuner, also used up on six meters as well. Couple characteristics for feed. It just depends on sort of what generation of ham you are, also the nature of the equipment you use and how tuner savvy you may be. But in the old days, the seminal article about the Loop Skywire recommended that you just feed it uh, with coax. You know, take your typical like Budwig center insulator, feed it with coax. And the thing is, it didn't make for a perfect match. However, it made for an adequate match across multiple bands. And if you don't have an external tuner, you would really get sufficient resonance to be within tuning range of most internal tuners on a rig or even on the Pi network output that used to be provided, you know, as a tunable capability with the old two power rigs. I will tell you that the implementation that we decided to go with, that Dan kind of came up with on his own and I endorsed, was the notion that we would use what is now considered to be sort of the approved feed for it, which is a ladder line based feed and to a one-to-one -one current ballon. And in Dan's case, he's got it hooked up to an auto tuner. However, even in the absence of an auto tuner, you can still get some pretty good SWR across a ton of bands using one of these loops. They are omnidirectional in nature. They tend to be very efficient antennas. Dan will testify uh, to sort of his empirical results that he's gotten of comparing this loop, which I'm gonna estimate is around 45 to 50 feet up there with a doublet that we had that uh, Dan sacrificed in the interest of the loop and cannibalized that was up probably around 60 feet and the improvement in the signal that he's getting as a result. So very efficient antenna. One other thing, in noisy environments, it's an antenna that inherently has an excellent signal to noise ratio. And that's something that comes to your benefit on 160 for sure. Here's the thing though, guys, it's all about real estate. Now, if you look at the statistics required, one of these guys, you'll see that the 40 meter requirement can be met by a lot of us if you just have a standard size lot. But boy, you wanna operate one of these suckers on 160 meters, then if you just cut by the classic loop formula of 105 or 1005 over the frequency in megahertz, you come up with 543 feet of wire required on the perimeter for a 160 meter uh, horizontal loop. And if you're gonna have it in a square configuration, you're figuring 135.75 feet aside. So this is a big antenna, no kidding. 80 meters though starts to get reasonable, right? Works out, uh, you know, if you're talking about operating maybe somewhere around 3.700 to about 272 feet, about 68 feet aside. I'll tell you though where it gets very reasonable and is within the reach of a lot of guys that just have an urban lot with a couple of trees is the 40 meter scenario is 142 feet with 35.5 feet aside. And you know what? That's doable for a lot of people. What's the key variable? You need a nice lot. And really the other thing is you need trees on the periphery of that lot. And that's where Dan's lot 
really sets him up well, ultimately. All right, so, basics. What you're looking at is the loop sky wire is gonna be a wavelength of wire in terms of the perimeter. The best results you're gonna get in terms of shape are gonna be those that produce the largest internal area that's bounded in effect by the loop. And by that scenario, or the scenario that's gonna be the most efficient is if you set it up in a circular configuration. Now I want you to consider something though. You wanna have a circular loop, you're gonna have a lot of support points. And it's just gonna be sort of a derived circular if you know what I'm saying. Um, it does work very efficiently. Who knows? Well, Uncle Sam tested that configuration out many years ago and found out it was, in fact, the most efficient loop configuration you can use. It just did away with it based on the pain in the neck of maintaining all the supports to give you that shape. All right. Now, the most frequently used implementation is that of a rectangle. Now, if you can have a square, that's going to behoove you. So, you know, an equal side square kind of configuration is going to be more efficient than a rectangular configuration. But really, what all drives it is the nature of your lot. That's the main component. I will tell you, though, that there's a lot of people that have discussed with me doing one of these loops, and they'll just tell you, hey, I don't got the four support points, but I do got three. Guys, there's no reason you can't use a triangle either. It's not going to be as effective as a rectangular, but it's not a bad configuration at all. In fact, there are some people, if you go up into northern New England, that have loops strung through a bunch of trees that don't really approximate much of anything, if you follow me, that work perfectly fine. So shape is secondary when all things considered. And you don't have to have a pure rectangle. You don't have to have a pure square. Okay. So if we go back to the formula, if we were looking at doing one for 160 meters, and if it was me, I would cut it for 1.850. Now, me, potentially, I'd like to use a linear down at the bottom part of the band with the minimum of hassle to my tuner, and that's why I would pick 1.850. Opinions are going to differ on that. But 543 feet on the perimeter, divide it by four, you come up with 135.75 feet if you're going to implement it as a square. And it's like I say, the loop shape is going to be driven by your lot characteristics. You just deal with what you've got. Dan's got a nice lot, but like a lot of backcountry lots, I would say it's a deep lot, so that a lot of square footage he attributes to the lot based on the fact that the lot runs for several hundred feet behind his home. It would help if it was a little bit wider, but again, you just deal with the implementations of what you got. Now, his perimeter for his loop is at 100, 520 feet. I think that's predicated on the standard formula, returning a value of 1.930, where there's a lot of net activity if you know much about 160 meters. Now, based on his limitations, what he's dealing with now, that he's put fixed insulators onto his loop and he's done the calculations, is that he's got two sides of the rectangle, the long sides that are 180 feet, and two short sides that are 80 feet each. That's not what I'd call a perfect rectangle, but it's serviceable for sure, okay? He's got a surprise. The surprise has to do with his resonant frequency being considerably lower than what he would anticipate. So remember, bottom of 160 is going to be at 1.8 megahertz. And we're thinking that the formula, based on the formula, we should be returning resonance around 1.930. Okay? So what's up? <laughs> well, a couple of things. All right? But let me just point out, he's using the ideal tuned feed configuration on that antenna. Gives him a lot of flexibility. So it basically approximates a 600 ohm twin lead feed that he's put together using some standard parts and some standard recommendations, and it really is nice looking stuff. Comes in and is fed into a one-to-one -one current balance into an MFJ998 tuner. And the tuner tunes this baby up on 160, and I'm sure if Dan got back to you and gave you all his checkoff points across all the bands, this sucker's got no problems tuning up on any band. Would I be overly concerned about the point that the resonant frequency doesn't coincide with what the formula would imply? Actually, I wouldn't, okay? And a couple of things still need to be worked out with the antenna, just minor tweaks here and there, that might return that antenna to a more predictable resonance scenario. But again, if the sucker gives you empirical results and it's within the range of the tuner, that's your criteria for whether or not the horizontal loop is working, not where it's dipping at resonance. All right? A couple of things, though, that could be considered. And these are just discussions Dan and I have had about the nature of the lot. It is possible 
that we could make one of the longer runs look a little bit more symmetrical or sort of semi-circular if we were to throw in yet another support rope and throw it over a white pine that kind of abuts his property and is just a little bit over the property line. It's also possible we could extend one of the shorter sides in a triangular pattern near the end of the driveway. And we may try doing that just in the interest of shortening the longer length. And that's also based on the notion that Dan wants to bring this thing to inherent residence within the band, you know, which is certainly a noble thing to strive for. Also understand that, you know, on Dan's plans, eventually there may be a linear, thus the quality of the build components that he's put in this loop. So the homemade twin lead, certainly a plus. Also, he's using number 12 gauge Home Depot wire, which is certainly up to the task for this loop. All right. The other thing that needs to be possibly trimmed a little bit to get more predictable resonance is the feed line is, I don't think in an optimal scenario right now, once it's trimmed to the right length and once it's coming down straight from the antenna without taking a few curly curls or a few obstacles, things may become a little more predictable. All right. But again, one more consideration is the feed point might be put up a little bit higher. The way Dan's lot is laid out is such that it's difficult to meet the design objective about putting the center feed near one of the fixed insulators tied to one of the support ropes. It's just an awkward configuration where the wire has to come down and go into Dan's office as equidistant between the two support points and there's not much we can do about it. So raising the feed point as well might make things a little bit more predictable in terms of the results that we're getting. But again, by my criteria, if the tuner is tuning without any problems and you're getting out good results across the bands, you don't have to agonize over setting the resident frequency. All right, a couple other things. One thing to just concern yourself when you're looking at a lot like Dan's is it's an okay lot for a 160 meter horizontal, but let me tell you, it's a superb lot for an 80 meter. Why? Because he's got the run length to make it a perfect square. And because of the downward slope of his front driveway, he could focus the antenna more over the downward driveway and in effect, have an 80 meter loop that would be, could be up as high as around 60 feet. Now, let me just show you a little bit about what we were dealing with on the lot. So I do love this lot. For the moment, I walked it with Dan, looked at it, saw the elevation. I have a rough idea where it is in Greenwich. And you do not look uphill in any direction from this lot. So what you're seeing right now is the backyard. Um, Dan's got a vertical up here for two meters that he home brewed. And kind of parallel to it, but not remarkably close, is the feed line going right up to the center feed point. Now, the tie-off support rope is all the way back here. So again, we really can't meet that criteria of shrinking, if you will, the pull down effect of the uh, center insulator and of the connecting twin and ladder line by having it closer to the corner. It's just a, something we have to deal with. But I'm gonna estimate that the feed point of the loop is up at around 45 feet. Portions of the loop on the other side of the property may be as high as 55 to 60 feet. But I do want to give you a realistic idea based on the supports as to how far you can get one of these loops up into the air. Because Dan and I looked at these trees, we did a walkthrough layout the week before. <coughs> and what we're looking at is a bunch of trees that range anywhere from 70 to 80 feet arrayed around the outer periphery of his property. Again, perfect for a loop. So front yard supporting tree, here it is, it's 70 feet. It's very difficult to spot the loop in this picture, unfortunately, but basically there's an insulator right around here and one part of the rope, the line is going this way and the other part is going this way to the back of the house. Now, again, if we go to the rear main tree, that's the closest to the feed point, this is in the backyard, it too is up at around 70 feet. And really that's the common denominator for all the trees because the other hookup tree in the backyard, which is close to the property line deep and to the right, right, is a similar scenario. We estimate it's up around 65 to 70 feet. Do the math though, just understand that because the feed point ropes are up at 70 to 75 feet, doesn't mean the loop's going that high, guys. This is a heavy loop to pull up in the sky. Again, it's number 12 gauge solid. So the net result in my experience is just figure that you need to subtract anywhere from 20 to 25 feet from 
the elevation of where the support ropes go over the top of the trees to give you the practical derived height of where the loop will sit. So this loop sitting at around 45 feet at the feed point. It would be nice to get it up a few more feet if possible, but you can live with that if necessary. So overall, I'm impressed with the effort. So let me just describe to you what this took. We were blessed with the best shooting day I've probably ever had. I'm not kidding. If it was a mile an hour breeze at 100 feet, I would have been amazed. It was just dead calm. Five total hours to pull it up because Dan had the whole thing pre-assembled and laid out. That's what really got us off to the head start. We worked very efficiently, but five solid hours. Now, I have a calculation that I always use for field day, which is if I'm working efficiently with the gun and I'm getting the shots done with 100% accuracy, it's going to take me on average one hour per line fixed when I'm putting up lines 70, 80 feet up in a tree. And we almost stuck to that average because we had four lines to shoot. We did have an intermediate snag with one tree as we were pulling up one side of the loop, and that cost us a little bit of time. I will tell you, though, that the second to the last shot that we did was a situation where we wanted to have low exposure to the next door neighbor and just discreetly put a support rope that would come straight down the barrel of a tree dead on the property line. And so no kidding, guys, if you've ever watched me on field day, or if you watch the GNR crew, they're pretty good with their guns as well. What we'll tell you, the thing is, the most infuriating thing is when someone says, okay, I need a straight up shot, make this an 85 to 90 degree angle, can you do it? And I'll always look at you, curse under my breath and say, oh, I can start doing it. When you see what happens when it starts to decay and the wind catches it, though, you're going to puke. Well, no lie, guys, it was so dead that we fired at about an 85 degree angle. It went straight over the tree canopy and straight down the other side of the trunk. We couldn't believe it. It wasn't skill. It's what shooting on a perfect day is all about. By the way, on field day, ha, we've never had a perfect day. <laughs> all right. Here's the other thing. Just lessons learned that I want to go into, and one of it has to do with the story of four perfect support trees, but an intermediate tree that caused a snag, which really cost us about 45 minutes to an hour as we had to trim away the tree branches that were impeding the hoisting job. All right. So just a couple bits of advice based on my experience with this horizontal loop, but in general with other horizontal loops I've talked about with people and putting them up. We started with the horizontal loop assembled. There's something to be said for that technique, though, because we knew what we were up against and we knew where the corners would lay out approximately because it was all put together. I will tell you, though, that in my experience, when you're trying to hoist the loop, OK, um, just leave one end free, because if you hit an intermediate snag, you can pull the wire from the free end, use the cannon to fire it over the snag and reconnect at the center insulator. The fact that we didn't have that capability costs us a little bit of time. So the other thing I'm going to recommend is when you're putting up your four corner insulators, you should have at least one of them that's a floater. And the reason you want a floater is because you're never going to have 100% symmetry, even on an allegedly perfect square root. And what having that insulator floating does is enables you to really make the loop taut in its horizontal position. And there's something to be said for that approach. But if you're going to use multiple floating insulators, because a lot of pros swear by two fixed and two floating, always make certain that one of the fixed insulators is the one that's in close proximity to your center insulator attached to the feed line. So let's talk a little bit about cost. And I will tell you this is going to cost you a little bit more money than putting up a dipole. But there's something to be said for the efficiency of these loops, because I have heard adherents say that once you put up one of these guys, it's not unusual for you to hoist out every wire antenna you've got on your lot. It can basically take their place. Horizontal loops, by the way, are not known to peacefully coexist with a ton of antennas within their circumference. So again, sometimes people will just go with the loop and end up taking down other antennas. But if you really want a pretty good cost estimate as to what you're going to be set back soup to nuts configuring one of these, I put together a couple of very realistic estimates. All right. So for the 160 meter loop, again, um, Dan used a cutting formula and an assumption that gave him an overall length of 520 feet. Let's assume instead we're using my 1.8.850 uh, frequency for 60, 160, 
you're going to need 545 feet of wire. Now, again, Dan used some real heavy, good, heavy duty 12 gauge stuff. I don't know that it's necessary for everybody to use that. I would recommend the 14 gauge that you can get at Home Depot. It'll set you back 50 bucks for 500 feet. Now, that was a month or two ago. God knows her copper prices have gone since then. Now, I will tell you that if you, that ends up short because you can't find 40 feet in your scrap drawer. Give me a call, boys. I'll be happy to give you 45 to 50 feet to make you all. I've got more odd scraps of 14 gauge around here than you can put shake a stick at. All right. Figure four, 500 feet of support rope for your four support lines. That'll give you 125 feet per. And you can pick that stuff up if you just go on eBay, right? And I'm talking about, I believe in this case, using the 316 size. Uh, Dan decided to go with something a little bit heavier. It's going to cost you probably twice as much. But figure about 50 bucks for the spool of the support line, three bucks for four, uh, four, three bucks for four decent insulators. And now it's just a function of which feed you'd like to go to. So the twin, the twin lead option, right, which more or less implies that you're feeding it into one-to-one -one ballon in a tuner, is going to set you back $153. Figure $30 for the ladder line, 20 bucks for a center insulator. If anyone wants to go that route, guys, I've got about a half a dozen of ladder lock center insulators we've got from the States. I'll be happy to sell you one for five bucks. They're going for 20 a pop at this stage of the game. Your other option, and this is a good option for someone that's just got an Icon or a Yezu or a Kenwood that's got a fairly decent internal tuner, but not an external tuner, and you don't want to throw a ballon at it, then you can use the alternative configuration that was the original recommended feed for this antenna, which is to just use some RG8X coax, get yourself 75 feet, figure on eBay, 40 bucks, right? Combine that with a basic coax center insulator for 15 or 20 bucks, you're on the air with the loop for $163. But guys, really, it's more the geography than it is the cost. And I'm sure that can occur to all of you. All right. But let me tell you, it's a great Sunday. I was proud to work on this project because I'll tell you, it's nice to try out something that you've heard about for a long time, but you've never been able to implement on your own. I may yet get up one of these 40 meter uh, loop sky wires uh, just to see how it will work on my property because I have a configuration to do it on a triangular basis. Anyway, that's the input that I have that's basic to the process. Uh, Dan can chime in with some of his empirical results, which I understand uh, have been pretty darn good since he's put one of these up. Guys, you get a lot of wire in the air, you'll be amazed at what you can hear. I just wanted to give you a couple follow-up stuff. I'm not an, not an old hand at the next conversation I'm gonna get into, but just talks a little bit about safety. So. One of these loops has the amazing capacity to pick up static electricity. So I do understand a standard recommendation when using a loop in the 160 meter horizontal category is to use some bleeder resistors on it. Also to use some lightning arresters on the feed line. I'm not much of in a position to comment on that. If anyone else has experience with that directly, feel free to chime in. But at this stage of the game, Steve, it would probably make sense for you to turn it over to Dan so he can give everybody a rough idea as to what he's hearing on the bands and the improvement that he's been getting. So you want to take it away? Yeah, um, I have reclaimed. Dan, I don't know if you have something to share or you just want to speak on it. I guess, I guess I'll just speak on it. I don't really have much to share. Uh, Terry showed the pictures. I know it was hard to see. Um, I, I have an analyzer that analyzed the antenna, the radiation, but I don't need to show that. So I'll just talk about it, talk about what I did and what we did and how I've been using it. Should I go ahead? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, good. All right, just, just a couple of clarifications to bring Terry up to date. Uh, I'm not using the MFJ 998 uh, tuner that's in my closet. Uh, you probably recall I, I put that new ballon in my uh, Palstar HT 5K, the AT 5K. So, so that's what I'm using. So the ballon that Terry's referring to is not an external ballon, it's the one inside uh, the tuner. And, uh, so any, so we put, we originally put it up and, um, it was fantastic. I mean, it was like night and day. And I, I started out with uh, a long wire and then had built that uh, 260 foot doublet, which was 130 feet each side with the ladder line, which I thought worked great. But then I kind of got the bug in myself to put up a loop 
I, I just, I guess from reading and talking to people. So the day we put up the loop, it was just an amazing difference. The, the receiving, um, it, it was just louder. And it was uh, pro probably when I, when I check out some of the guys that I listen to or talk to on 160 meters at least, it was probably a five to 10 dB difference. Now, of course, propagation could be there, but I used the, long, the, the doublet long enough to know uh, what the difference was. It also was much quieter. I didn't get a lot of static and a lot of uh, noise that I would normally get. So those were the two things that I noticed. But the biggest thing I noticed is, uh, and I'm only using hundred Watts, is that if I get into a pileup or I'm trying to call when there are a lot of other people calling, I get through. I get through on the first or second call. And it's absolutely amazing that I'm being heard with such, with such ease and such clarity. Uh, and again, thanks to Jonathan for getting me that resistor for the D104. So, um, you know, this is, you know, I happen to, uh, my wife and I bought this property. We, I never even thought of putting up an antenna and it just turned out that it was the right property for whatever reason. It's, it's on a hill. It's, uh, there's nothing around us that much. Um, I never thought of doing it until the pandemic when I got more involved in amateur radio and bought a new radio, sold my equipment, got the new tuner and I have the time and I love socializing on ham radio. So I said, why not make the best of it? So on 160, I can get down to North Carolina. I can get out to uh, Wisconsin. I get up into Canada. I think that's pretty good uh, considering propagation these days, which has not been so good. Uh, it's, it's, it tunes all the way from 160 to six meters with this tuner. And uh, I used the Nano VNA to find that um, um, that sweet spot, that uh, uh, the Smith the Smith chart to find exactly where it is. Because with a tuner, you can have multiple nulls that might work, but you don't want to get RF back in the in. So I found the one with that, and uh, I work uh, 17 uh, meters. I work 15 meters. Has been open lately, and I get down to Brazil. Uh, I did notice uh, a change in, uh, not a change, but addition of areas that I wasn't able to really hear or haven't heard with the doublet because the doublet was north-south. So now I'm getting into um, uh, Northern Ireland. I'm getting into deep into Europe. I'm getting into Africa. Uh, I'm getting into uh, California with, with great ease. Uh, South America, I've always gotten, but now I'm getting into more of Central America and South America. Uh, I still have yet to get into Australia and Japan uh, or New Zealand. Uh, I was able to do that with the doublet on, on, uh, in Australia, but I haven't really tried because I guess they're different hours than we are. And I just, and I, I want to explain that the length of it. So I'm using 12 gauge solid copper wire and, my, and, and I folded my doublet back to make this work. Uh, as Terry told you, the measurements. The reason I'm at 520 feet is because there's a formula, and, and Terry taught, we talked about it, that because I'm using coated copper wire, you have, I had to, there's a different formula or percentage that you need to reduce the length of the wire based on the, the, um, the copper wire has a coating to it. So it actually should be 519 and five and a half inches and that's roughly where it is. It's between 519 and 520 feet, but I am resonating much below the 160 and all the other bands. I sent Terry the whole list. And I believe it's because my original doublet may have stretched. And even though I went out and measured it, I, I don't know why it's there. So I'm gonna be fooling with the ladder line. The ladder line was measured at 62 feet is where I found it to work great when I had the doublet. But now I'm gonna experiment with the ladder line and see maybe I could reduce that a little bit. And maybe that might bring the resident frequency down because the ladder line coming down is actually part of the antenna. So, uh, so that's really it. And I, I know, you know, maybe you guys don't have the property to do it. I understand that, but there's all different ways to shape this, like Terry said, and you can even make a loop for 20 meters. You can make a loop for 15 meters. You can make a loop for any band and it doesn't have to be 520 feet if you're, if you're using the other bands. And, and believe me, when that sunspot cycle comes back, this antenna will probably be very, that's, this is my, my special needs son and his and, friend who he 
pops on my head and, once in a while. And, and can I say hi, Jay? Say hi real quick. Hi. Okay, that's Ben. Hi. Okay. <laughs> thank you thank you Jonathan it's all right all right so right, so Jonathan. basically that's it I mean it's it's worked really well it, it it met all my expectations if not more um and you know I still recommend the doublet with ladder line you can buy ladder line from uh um uh, that ladder Home line Depot. company no no that's where you got to make it you, if you don't want to make it true ladder line sells ladder line that you can have pre-made to put on there um I happen to like it I I think it's good I don't use coax with it uh, some people do um, that that wireless girl has a website. If you ever seen her, she talks about the loops. She has a, a, a place upstate New York. She does use 75 ohm uh, coax with her loops. And she writes all about that too. So there's many, many ways to do this. Nobody's no, nothing is perfect. And you know, the dimensions of it, I've, I've lined it up where I think it's as square as possible, uh, re as rectangle as possible, but it really doesn't matter how accurate that is. Uh, I'm just anal about it. I just like things to be, you know, as accurate as possible. So uh, I share that with you guys. And if anybody wants to come over and visualize and see what it looks like, you're more than welcome to come over. Just send me an email or give me a call on the on the on the on the on the, on the uh, repeater or whatever. Be happy to show it to you. So that's really all I've got to say, unless somebody wants to ask me questions. Terry, was that okay? Yeah, no, no, good accurate representation. And I guess, guys, the other thing that I would just point out is. Those are good technical pictures. I lack the capacity to spontaneously blow them up to show you the loop. But if you are dealing with a fussy neighbor scenario and you're looking for low profile antenna, as surprising as it sounds, if it's done right, and if people are looking at it once the leaves are on the trees, I got news for you. It may be harder to spot this loop than it would be a conventional dipole running down the middle of the property. Again, it's usually on the periphery of the property line and it makes it a little bit less noticeable as a result. That's it for me. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Dan. Any questions for Dan or Terry? Yeah, what happens if you use the 450 ladder line instead of 600 ohm? Yeah, Stan, my recommendation is just throw up whatever ladder line you got. And for most people, that is the 40, you know, the 450 ohm stuff. I will tell you though, when you look at the 600 ohm stuff when it's properly assembled, Stan, the aesthetic qualities of it alone are enough to make you want to buy it. It just looks like the old fashioned stuff. You know what I'm saying? The other thing though, Stan, is just consider Dan as a possible candidate for two kilowatt linear another year or two down the road. And so as we've designed this configuration, it's always been with that possible footprint coming. Well, Jerry, guys, Jerry, I, how, how heavy is your uh, tennis ball and how much pressure did you need to get it up in the trees? Sure. Um, my tennis balls generally, when dry, and that's a problem during the spring, <laughs> when dry are filled with two grams of what I believe is shotgun shot. Now, on a rainy day, or if they're just a little bit moist, John, it adds marginally but still significantly to the weight of the ball. I did have one pristine ball and one dirty soaked ball. And no kidding, when I used the dirty soaked ball, it didn't go as high, but I'm telling you, that's the one I used for the vertical straight drop and it worked perfectly. The PSI rating that I was shooting at was relatively low. And the reason is I didn't have any intermediate trees of significance to shoot over. So my average shot was probably done from anywhere between 40 to 60 PSI, John. So the weight of your ball, though, is enough to uh, pull the line down uh, through the branches? Yes. And, you know, the real trick, guys, is leaves. When there's no leaves on the trees and therefore nothing to impede the ball as it goes down, it's amazing how effectively, if I've got it at the right arc, the ball will drop along the uh, tree trunk. The problem is, is that once the leaves get on the trees, as much as it might strike you that a single leaf doesn't do much to affect the trajectory, a few leaves on a tree can have the ball skip in a lateral direction and go off in the middle of nowhere when you're trying to retrieve it. So that's why I always love to shoot in March or April. Here's the problem though. March is known for its breezes. So finding that combination of a perfect day before the leaves are on the trees is a rare one. And that's where Dan and I got so lucky a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Next. Do you need that uh, uh, ballon, the one to one uh, ballon in there? Um, you know, if you're going to do the, uh, if you're going to be doing the twin lead, I believe so, Stan, if for no other reason than you just have to tie it off to the coax anyway, you know. 
And, and the thing is too, if the assumption is you're using an external tuner, then you probably got a 401 in there, which you'd get away with using. I will just say though, Stan, if you've noticed that some of the latest generation of even the manual tuners have shifted away from the four to ones to the one to one current balance. And that's what Dan was able to take advantage of. So yeah, I do like that combination of the twin lead with the one to one. Question for Dan. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, uh, Dan. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Good, Rob. How long? How far is the feed line from your uh, to your from your shack up to the high point? Oh well, it's uh, it's right outside my window in my office here. So uh, it, it's probably up about forty five feet. Terry and I think uh, because the ladder line is measured, and I have the ladder line roped up, the extra roped up. So it's a 62 feet ladder line right now with two holes drilled in the wall that come right into the uh, into the PAL star. So right now that's 62 feet. And that was based on the doublet um, at that at this point. I haven't touched it yet. I'm going to experiment maybe this uh, this weekend with that. All right. Yeah, that's 600 ohm uh, feed line, correct? Well, you know what? It's it's four inch spread, 12 gauge. So I've seen it. People say it's 450. Some say it's 600. It's, you know. Yeah, that's 600. Rob, if you can find us an army surplus 10 kilowatt linear, trust me, this feed line can handle it. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, I, I've dealt with feed line quite a bit. And I've known people that, uh, matter of fact, Dan, I think you were on uh, yesterday, the day before. Were you on that uh, that loop the day I talked to you on 3822? Yeah, I actually, um, I talked to your friend up there, Chris, because he, he has a loop also, and he had 574 feet on his website. So I questioned him. I said, Chris, you know, I'm a friend of Rob's. Uh, where'd you come up with that? And he corrected me. He says, I haven't updated my QRZ page. It's really 512 feet. So that, I was just curious where he came up with that number. Um, but the guys, I don't know if you were listening today, uh, just so everybody knows, during the, during the mornings I trade, so I'm not really active, but I, I sometimes have the radio on and I listen. And uh, those guys were talking about a loop and ladder line this morning on uh, 3822. Uh, nice group of guys. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that people are talking about these loop antennas. It's, it's, I'm hearing it more and more on the radio with ham radio operators. Yeah, I've known for about them for years. I just don't have the configuration. The... The configuration, that's the whole thing. You could have the property, but the configuration of uh, setting that. Yeah, that's KC2RGW. That's Chris up in New Hampshire. And right. he's running that with 300 ohm uh, feed line, uh, Dan. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, you could you can run it with anything. If you've got a good tuner, you know, guys, you, you can you can tune it to a coat hanger sometimes. As long as, you know, like like um, I have an engineer friend that also Terry knows that's been helping me with uh, understanding these. He's a commercial engineer. And, if, you know, it, it really doesn't matter about the length of the antenna if you have a tuner. It will matter, like Terry said, if you're using your internal tuner of the radio, then that length will matter because that internal tuner is not the same as a as like a PAL star, per se. Per se. And I tried and I tried tuning it with my internal, but because I'm not on the band with my residents, it wouldn't tune. Yeah, the tuner is going to make up for any anything there. If it's close to resident, but the tuner will make up for that uh, very much. And about 40 feet is an ideal uh, uh, height for that. And yes, you are going to notice the noise reduction. It's unbelievable at that height there. I yeah. use an on the ground loop uh, receive antenna and it's just unbelievable during static crashes on 160 or whatever. And it just, it's just like cuts them, you know, like in half. Oh, that, that's another thing, guys. When, when I pre-assembled the loop to save time for Terry, uh, when I brought it down and I, and, I, and I spliced in the other 260 feet, because the, the original, the first one was 260 feet. I actually had it lying on my roof and strung to trees at 10 feet. Right, Terry? You remember that when you got yes. here? You saw that? Yes. And I, and, and, and I assembled that on Saturday because Terry came over on Sunday. And I wanted to get on the air Saturday night. And I'm like, oh, my antenna's not up. It's lying on the ground. I was able to tune a one-to-one -one SWR with that antenna lying across my flat roof, which I think has got aluminum components to it, and lying on the ground in some areas. And my ladder line was definitely 62 feet curled around on the ground right outside my window. And that antenna tuned. So it's very forgiving. 
that's the key word. It's very forgiving as a loop. And it does, you can, I, Rob, is yours on the ground? Oh, it, mine's an uh, receive on the ground loop, not, not a transmitting. It, it, I have the dipole with the 160 meter uh, uh, tra transformer there at the bottom have, of my feed line. Have you tried to transmit it with it on the ground? No, no, I no, I have I haven't tried to do that, and it's okay. it's not it's not going to be cut for that. It's basically designed to receive there. Oh, okay. I have I have a question. Your ropes that are coming down your insulators, did you put pulleys on the end of those so you can pull it up and down easier later on? No, there's no pulleys. I have uh, I'm using five sixteenths Dacron rope from HRO, and um, I have uh, it tied to the insulators. And coming through the trees and down to, uh, I have metal fence posts, and it's just tied to that. And uh, when I do lower it, because I've done it many times working on it, um, I have to lower all the corners, and then I have to kind of reach up with a big pole that I have to pull it down, and then it pulls the rope that I, I let from the uh, other side loose. Can I make? Can I make a, can Dan, I make a You got to worry. You got to worry about the trees actually growing around the rope. It's happened. Yeah, well, you know, eventually uh, you know, that will happen. But, um, you know, these trees are kind of old. I don't know how long they're going to stay up there to begin with. And, uh, and, I, and I don't, I have it tight, but because of the weight of it, it actually, it actually is coming down a little bit. So it's bouncing. And that's pretty good because that's when, when, the, uh, when the winds blow. Because last weekend, as you know, we, we had some very strong winds. I was watching it very carefully. And because it's it's floating in the air up there, when the trees pull it, it really it really has a, a lot of compensation to it. So, you know, listen, I'm more worried that it's a lightning rod. That that's my uh, biggest concern. Uh, definitely, yep. you definitely need some protection. Yeah. So that's my next step. And by the ARRL lightning insurance, they I sell insurance know. for your whole shack. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. I'll well, I, that. Got a, I got a suggestion to everybody. I don't care what kind of lightning arresters or whatever you got. A guaranteed is a full disconnect away from your house. Yeah, I, I have outside uh, where I'm able to disconnect the ladder line. I have the way I have it connected. I can unscrew it and just let it hang in the air. Well, you could get a knife switch. Right. Yeah, the no, knife no, switch. No, 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 lightning no, will jump. no. Lightning will jump a knife switch. Well, yes, ground it, it. Ground it. Yeah, no, it will. Ground. No, it will jump. Lightning will find its way. The best way, and I do the same thing, Dan. Mine are on uh, eyelets with uh, wing nuts, and Steve's seen it, and I pull it completely away from the house there. Yeah. You keep, you isolate it completely. Then the, the feed line that comes in the house, I have knife switches off, and those go to ground in here. Right. But anything is totally disconnected away from the house. Now, the reason I suggested pulleys, Dan, the, the rope that's coming down from the tree that goes to your insulators, you put pulleys on that and then your, di uh, your, your rope that you can pull things up easier. And then your tree set ropes will stay put. Well, then you have two sets of ropes. Yes, but it, it, I know a lot of guys have done that even with dipoles. Yeah. Uh, can I just make an observation? I've yeah. seen those pulley based systems and I don't like them. Okay. <laughs> I don't like them. You know why? Listen, you no, really no, have to engineer no, them well, or the rope, the rope gets stuck in the pulley, and it's the worst scenario than anything you can imagine. All right, Terry, can right I say something? Rope. No, I'd rather repair a torn yeah. rope than try to fish it out of a pulley that's now stuck seventy-five feet up in a tree. You'll never, <laughs> yeah, you'll never, you'll never get full and be able to break that those uh, antenna ropes with the outer and inner wrappings, that, that stuff is stronger than steel. Well, you know why that happens? Yeah, why? Because you're buying Home Depot uh, pulleys. No, no, I didn't buy home. I bought them from like DX I, and they didn't get stuck on me. No, no the, you, the best the best pulleys are the marine pulleys. Though. Exactly. Yes, All, you guys are right. All you guys are right. It's a function of using good pulleys. It's true. But you know, uh, the, you, the, the, the antenna pulley? doesn't cost that much. So if something breaks or something, I ju I'm just going to replace it. It's, you know, it's not like I went out and bought a $600 and $800 antenna. Mm. Oh, oh, no, I'm not saying that. Hart, Hart, they're made by Harkins. They're 20 oh. millimeter. Uh, a combo yeah, no, I know they're made. Yeah, they're, good. They're, they're, they're the best. I've had no problem. I think Steve even has them on, on the end. Yeah, I understand it's not inexpensive, Dan, but what, Steve, what's, what, what do you say? I'm anal about my antennas. 
I, <laughs> I, I am. They come down once a year for an inspection. Inspection every, every year. They get changed out every three years, not the feed line, but the wire that's up there. The ropes get changed out every three years because you know why? I don't want the weather to tell me that I can't get on the air. Right. I want to make that decision when I'm not on the air. <laughs> Right. No, no, it's, a, it's a, all good advice. But you know what else? I would echo what Dr. John said, though, about spurious stuff growing on your ropes, because now we let so many of these freaking invasive vines wrap themselves around nice trees and your ropes that I would echo what he said and know why. Dan, you may remember me saying this before I left the property, which is now do yourself a favor. Yank hard on those support ropes about once every four to five weeks yeah. to make certain that sucker vines don't attach themselves to the ropes. Yeah. No kidding. It is a major concern these days. Well, it'll take a lot longer for the tree to grow around. Even if you went out, you know, once a year, or maybe every six months. And oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, I tell you what, there's a, Rob, Rob, there's a new generation of sucker vines. We've seen them up at the museum and no shit. Three weeks, they can be around 50 to 60 feet of antenna rope wrapped between it and like a poplar sapling. Yeah. I mean, the bark, the bark can grow around the rope and basically the rope ends up embedded in the tree. I had a steel a dog dog line, you know, oh, yeah. dog oh, yeah. running, running <laughs> through, and it, you know, it was there for like 15 years. Now it, when I right. left the house, I mean, the ro the tree was halfway around the rope. I mean, it was in the center of the branch. Oh yeah. I, I, use, a, uh, like I use a pulley on one side of my dipole, right? And I use it with a weight on right. the uh, the end. So when the trees do move, it moves the weight up and down. And counterbalance. And it doesn't break the it doesn't break the dipole. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's what I have on mine. I got a pulley system. Me too. All right, gentlemen, that is your antenna edification for this session. No, oh, very nice. Very uh, nice. Thank uh, you, uh, Jerry, thank you, Dan, yeah, again yes. for a wonderful presentation. Well, thank you. Until next year, so we can have you again. <laughs> I must say it was the most enjoyable. For field day? I'm sorry. I got a backyard. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, true. Inside. <laughs> inside. <laughs> got to bring your own generator. <laughs> oh, we got those. We got I plenty like of generators. Yes. Love, we own one. Yeah, right. We own a nice one with an external tank. Right. No, so here's for field so day, gentlemen. You got yes. for a steel. Right. Gentlemen, let me make the following observation. If somebody does want to use the club generator for field day, please let me know. And we will make arrangements. So, you know, if you come up with a magical solution of, whoa, whoa, do it my house, and you want to take the club generator, let me know. All right, because I've got it over here. And it's, in, it's still in great condition, and we do have that external tank. And no lie, what we discovered with it is you load that external tank along with the regular fuel tank, and you'll have beyond the air for 72 hours, probably, before you have to refill it. Yep. All right. Can I say one last thing before I go? I got to uh, give my uh, grandson a hug there. Uh, thank you for. Yeah, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Hurry yeah. up. Thank you for letting me in. Uh, uh, a Good great uh, presentation, you. Terry, and uh, a nice job, Dan. Well, I'm going to have to stop up. And like Dan says, I'm going to take a look. Yep. 38, 38, 22 there during the days in the mornings there. We got a nice, really nice group of guys are from around the area, Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania. So if anybody wants to stop in and uh, say hello, you know, feel free to, you know, we're more than happy to have you come in. And let me tell you, it's hard to find a nice group of guys these days. <laughs> oh, yes. All right. All right, guys. All Good right. night, seven threes. Thank you very much. All right, Rob. Take care. Catch you later. Pay your dues. <laughs> your dues. <laughs> That's all. Gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen, I have to now go do the masculine thing of starting dinner. I'll see you all later. <laughs> all right. Does anybody? Thanks, Tim. Again. Thank you both. <laughs> Yeah, look, he leaves his screen up. How do I get rid of his? Screen? Does he have to release it? Yeah, I can make Terry, it. Cool. Terry, Terry. Yeah. Go I on. made it. I, I fixed it. Oh, he fixed okay. it. Okay, goodbye, Terry. Have a good dinner. All right, take care, guys. All right, anybody have any? What's this happy trail? Rob's got so much crap. <laughs> <laughs> he's got nothing to do. He makes all this stuff up. <laughs> yes, I know. Look, he's got a change in it. All right, anybody got anything that they wish to bring up tonight? All right, it looks like we're pretty good. Uh, thank you all. Have a happy Passover. I don't know, Jonathan, I don't, am I right? 
Yes. And through a Monday uh, evening. Okay. And, and uh, Monday. Uh, oh, boy. So Sunday evening. Oh, Sunday. Sunday. Let's see. Seven, uh, yeah. eight, no, it's eight days. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was Saturday. Saturday was the first, no. Friday was the first night. Saturday. No, Saturday was the first night. Right. So Saturday to Saturday, and then Sunday Saturday night. night. Sunday night. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't forget, anyway. John. If John, happy the last Easter, day of Passover, you, you light the yort site candles. The last day of Passover. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy. Thanks, all. Thanks again. Yep. That's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs>